Live from WRAL News Headquarters in Raleigh, your number one source for local news. WRAL News, coverage you can count on. Five people shot in Durham in less than two hours. Two are dead. Now city officials are faced with, again, how to stop the bloodshed there. New this noon, university and state officials examine the clash between police and pro-Palestinian protesters at UNC Chapel Hill. Governor Cooper's response as to why he did not call in the National Guard. And I'm tracking a system that could bring us a few isolated showers and thunderstorms later today, plus another one for the weekend. We'll go over the timeline. Five people were shot in Durham last night and two of those people died, including a 17 year old. Good afternoon to you. I'm Jeff Hogan. And I'm Renee Chu. Thanks for joining us. Police are investigating the two shootings that happened less than two hours apart late last night. WRL's Monica Casey is at that first shooting scene now. Monica, what are you seeing there? Renee, it is quiet here now. No remaining police presence, but you can see pieces of what happened here last night. Caution tape on the ground here by this stop sign. This is the intersection of West Umstead and South Street. We're just south of downtown Durham. Here's what the scene looked like last night. Police say two people were shot here. A woman had non life threatening injuries and a 17 year old boy died. Broadcast of I radio traffic shows first responders trying to find the two victims. In the call about another victim at 208 West Olmstead. You want me to start a whole different assignment for that? Uh, report another gunshot? Yeah, another GSW. The second shooting last night was at 1145, about two and a half miles away, just north of downtown on West Club Boulevard. That's right across the street from the elementary school there. Three people were shot. 51 year old Thomas Holloway Jr. died. The other two victims have life threatening injuries in that shooting. Police say both of these shootings appear to be isolated incidents and the preliminary investigation suggests they are not connected to each other. No arrests in either case yet. Renee. Monica Casey reporting live from Durham. Monica, thanks. A Durham County juvenile is facing several charges after bringing a gun to school. The teen was arrested yesterday at the City of Medicine Academy after school leaders alerted deputies about an alleged social media post threatening another student. Deputies searched the teen's book bag and found a 9mm handgun. The teen faces charges of possession of a firearm, possession of a firearm by a minor, and resisting arrest. And happening right now in the WREL Life Center, President Biden announced he will visit Charlotte on Thursday to meet with the families of the victims who were killed in Monday's standoff. We are waiting for the procession of U.S. Marshal Thomas Weeks. This is a live look there in Charlotte. Uh, they will eventually make their way from the medical examiner's office to the Calvin Cook Funeral Home. So as soon as that starts, uh, we will let you know. But as far as President Biden's visit, uh, he is expected to arrive in Charlotte on Thursday. He'll meet with the families. He also released a statement which we want to show you in part. He said that on uh, Monday night, he pra praised the heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice, saying they're heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice, rushing into harm's way to protect us. We mourn them for, and we mourn them and their loved ones. Uh, he also went on to say that leaders in Congress need to step up to ban assault weapons and also high capacity magazines. They also need to pass universal background checks and a national red flag law. Investigators are clarifying today nine law enforcement officers were either shot or injured in Monday's shooting in Charlotte. As we've reported, a deputy U.S. Marshal, two Department of Adult Corrections officers, and a Charlotte Mecklenburg police officer were killed during the standoff. Today we learned U.S. Marshal Task Force member that was injured is a corporal with the Statesville Police Department. Statesville Police say Corporal Casey Hoover was shot in the upper body in an area not protected by his bulletproof vest. He is expected to make a full recovery. A professor at Duke University was among the pro-Palestinian demonstrators detained yesterday at UNC Chapel Hill. Emily Rogers is an assistant professor of cultural anthropology. Rogers has a joint disorder and uses a cane to walk. She says police took her cane and arrested her. In all, 36 protesters were charged with trespassing. The faculty executive committee is holding an executive emergency meeting today at 4 o'clock to discuss events related to the protests on campus. 
Governor Roy Cooper shared his thoughts on what's unfolding at UNC this morning. First, the First Amendment is a bedrock of our society and needs to be protected. But it doesn't extend to uh, vandalism and to violations of the law. Uh, it is paramount to make sure that students are protected on campus. So you've got to make sure that steps are taken for, for that to be done. WRL will be keeping a close eye on that emergency meeting happening today at UNC. You can look for updates on our news starting at 4. House lawmakers are set to vote today on the Bipartisan Anti-Semitism Awareness Act. The legislation would mandate the standard the Department of Education enforced federal anti-discrimination laws that it uses to define anti-Semitism. Supporters say this will help combat anti-Semitism on college campuses where pro-Palestinian protests have sprung up recently. Opponents say the act overreaches and threatens free speech by equating criticism of the Israeli government with anti-Semitism. A small group gathered in front of the Wilson County Courthouse this morning as part of a community effort to remove a Confederate monument. WRL's Heidi Kirk is live at the courthouse now. Heidi, those protesters have one main message. Well, Renee, it's all about this monument that you'll see right in front of the Wilson County Courthouse. As you can see here, it was dedicated by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the Daughters of the American Revolution back in 1926. Now, I spoke with many rally goers today, and what they say is that this very monument that you'll see right here speaks to racism and division in our country. And those people are calling for its removal. Now, they say that back in the day, there actually used to be two water fountains, one on either side of this monument that were divided by race. Now, I spoke with one attendee today, and what he said is that he's ready for the whole thing to be removed. They took the water fountain down, but they left the monument up. And I think the monument is actually more intimidating and more frustrating than the water fountain, because it served no purpose but one. And that's motivating hatred, bigotry, segregation, everything that we fought to get rid of. Now, I want you to take a closer look at this monument here. You're going to see the American flag and the Confederate flag right here on it. And they're asking for these flags, this monument, to be removed within 30 days. Now, I got a statement from the county actually just moments ago. And what they told us is they're not sure if it can be removed, but they're looking for a way, a happy medium, to make sure that they're keeping both the protesters happy and the county happy themselves while still commemorating some of the things that this monument stands for. Renee. All right, we will see how this plays out. Heidi Kirk, live in Wilson. Our weather pattern right now will bring us a chance for isolated showers or storms this afternoon. Elizabeth Gardner is in the WRF Severe Weather Center right now with a look at maybe who has the best chance to see some rain, Elizabeth. So overnight last night and early this morning, we had some isolated showers and thunderstorms that developed around the Triangle area and slid eastward. So that lingering boundary that those storms developed on is still there. And you can see where we have some brighter white clouds developing. I'll draw a line there so you can pick that out. So right along that line, along that boundary is where we're most likely to see some of those storms developing. We take a look at future cast. You can see that line there. Uh, that brown line is a trough. Acts like a, a weak front. And by 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you can see one or two little cells pop up. And potentially, it will be a bit more coverage than we're seeing here on future cast. But it's not likely to be much. So from the triangle area south and east, we'll have that chance of an isolated shower or thunderstorm. We're giving it just a 20% chance. But starting right after lunchtime, just south and east of Raleigh, and it's likely to wrap up right about the time we hit sunset. We'll be dry for the next two days after that, but in the potential for some much heavier rain over the weekend. I'll show you how that could affect some of our favorite local festivals for the weekend in just a few minutes. Thanks, Elizabeth. United Methodists gathering in Charlotte for their major conference repealed their church's longstanding ban on LGBTQ clergy. This morning, United Methodist delegates removed a rule forbidding self-avowed practicing homosexuals from being ordained or appointed as ministers. The vote was 692 to 51 an overwhelming margin that contrasts sharply with the decades of controversy around this issue. The change doesn't mandate or even explicitly affirm LGBTQ clergy, but it means the church no longer forbids them. The measure takes effect immediately upon the conclusion of general conference, which is scheduled for Friday. A memorial service will be held Sunday for the principal of North Wake College and Career Academy. Elizabeth Battle died Monday. 
She joined North Wake as principal in 2017, and her service will take place Sunday, 2 o'clock in West Raleigh Presbyterian Church. It's located at 27 Horn Street. The ACC Player of the Year is returning to UNC Chapel Hill for a fifth season. All-American guard R.J. Davis wrote on Instagram, I'm back, and he posted a highlight video as well. He averaged 21 points a game in his senior season and moved up to fifth in all-time scoring for the program. It marks the second straight year a top UNC player has returned for a fifth season. Carolina fans, happy about that. We are now in May, and the month has special significance to the fastest growing racial demographic in our state. It's AAPI Heritage Month. That stands for Asian American and Pacific Islander. The population has grown 80% in the triangle over the last decade. Asian Indian and Chinese make up the largest ethnic groups. Look for stories highlighting the AAPI experience right here on WREL. Next at noon, Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene is going after her own party. Why she says she will call for a vote to oust Speaker Mike Johnson. Also, relaxing restrictions on marijuana, how the DOJ wants the drug to be classified, and what it means for the pot business. Plus, a drug that's become more dangerous over time. At 12.30, fentanyl families rally today. What they want you to know about the devastating effects. Keep watching WRAL News over the air channel 34 and Spectrum channel 1257. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene says she will call for a motion to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson sometime next week. Her threat follows the signing of a foreign aid bill by President Biden last week after Congress passed it with a bipartisan vote. Green is calling out Republicans and Democrats working together. She says Johnson has grown soft to the rival party. Funded Joe Biden's agenda and the Democrat agenda. Funded the Department of Justice that is wants to put President Trump in jail for the rest of his life, which is a death sentence. Mike Johnson fully funded the FBI, which raided Mar-a-Lago. And he gave him a brand new building as a gift. House leaders say they would protect Speaker Johnson from any resolutions calling for his ousting, writing in a statement that if Green invokes an impeachment motion, it will not succeed. A new report shows how elections have changed since 2020. Workers are reporting more harassment and officials are beefing up security. This is according to a new survey released by New York University's Brennan Center for Justice. Nearly 40 percent of local election officials say they've been harassed, abused or threatened. 92 percent of local elections officials have taken action to increase security. Durham's getting a new $24 million election operations center that will include high-tech security features. It opens later this year. It's been two years since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. A new CNN poll now finds only 34 percent of Americans approve the ruling limiting access to abortion. Those who strongly disapprove of the decision continue to outnumber those who strongly approve. That's by a margin of more than two to one. About half of U.S. adults want to abortion, want abortion access rights enshrined as a basic right. 37 percent say abortion laws should be left up to states. 14 percent call for nationwide restrictions. Federal restrictions for marijuana could soon become less strict. The Justice Department says it wants to reclassify the drug as lower risk. Its formal proposal sets off a process that could result in the change. Amy Kiley reports on what that would mean for businesses and users. On the schedule currently, marijuana is considered as dangerous as heroin. That could soon change. The Justice Department is starting the process to make marijuana a Schedule 3 drug instead of Schedule 1. That would put it on par with Tylenol containing codeine. Right now, marijuana is considered more dangerous than fentanyl, which is absurd, not to mention patently unfair. The change could ease criminal penalties help marijuana businesses bank more freely, and give tax benefits to state-licensed operators. But reclassification takes months due to steps outlined in the Controlled Substances Act. I've been smoking pot for like five decades. A Pew Research Center poll shows most Americans support legalizing marijuana for health or recreation. Reclassifying, it doesn't go that far, but advocates welcome looser restrictions. I was a heroin addict for many, many years. Just... Taking the edge off keeps me off of going back. Now a lot of athletes are consuming cannabis for their, for their own health and well-being. 
Others caution that marijuana can lead to health issues and addiction. A lot of the uh, news focus is on on fentanyl, but we have five times as many Americans with cannabis use disorder or cannabis addiction as we do with opioid use disorder. That was Amy Kiley reporting. 24 states and the District of Columbia allow recreational marijuana use. Most permit it for medical purposes, but without federal legalization, those state laws exist in a gray area. Carolina Hurricanes are moving on to the next round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Canes beat the New York Islanders last night at PNC Arena 6-3 in Game 5. So that gave the Canes win number four and closes out the series and advances them to play the New York Rangers next. Today, country superstar Scotty McCreary will be performing his latest hit on the Kelly Clarkson show. The Garner native will give a special performance of his song, Cabin a Solo. And it's on the show today. It's the first single off his new album, Rise and Fall, which is due out next week. You can see his appearance on The Kelly Clarkson Show today, 2 o'clock, here on WRAL. All those appearances line up, you know, with the release. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it kind of works out that way, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> it's working out that we're getting a mix of sun and clouds. Uh, we could see some rain later this afternoon. Meteorologist Elizabeth Gardner in the WRO Severe Weather Center. Oh, that makes me want to get out on the lake right now. <laughs> yeah, that's why I pulled it out. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't it? Gosh, this gorgeous view of Lake Gaston. Partly cloudy skies, and it feels so nice out there. Our temperature is currently in the 70s, and our dew point is creeping up, but it's still at a reasonable level. So it's going to be a gorgeous this afternoon out there. Now, up here around Lake Gaston, we have very little chance of any showers or thunderstorms, but if you're south and east of the Triangle, you'll have a slightly better chance. Even there, um, it looks like our coverage is going to be pretty minimal. We're almost at 80 right now, 79 degrees. Our wind is variable at 5 miles per hour. We'll top out in the mid-80s around 3 or 4 o'clock this afternoon. Check it out. Our temperatures, look at 73 in Roxboro, 80 in Rocky Mount, 79 in Raleigh, 78 Southern Pine, 77 in Fayetteville. So very comfortable out there right now around town. Again, Mid 80s in Raleigh and Durham and Fayetteville. Just going at 84 all across the board with a good bit of sunshine. All right, here's our muggy meter. We're sitting at 60 right now. As long as you can bring it down into the 50s, um, it's an easy, comfy, or you know, down into uh, the 30s and 40s. It's refreshing. But as we see our temperatures climbing into the 80s, uh, the hotter the temperature is, the more moisture the air mass can hold. And so we do tend to see the humidity climbing uh, or the amount of moisture climbing in uh, in the air as the temperature rise. So we've seen it creep up to 60. So that's, you know, on the border of tolerable and comfy. I was outside a little while ago in the shade. It feels lovely. But once we get into 65 and higher, it does really start to feel sticky. You'll notice it. And today, sitting at 60, you might notice that you may say, oh, yeah, it feels a little bit humid, but it won't feel terrible out there. Tomorrow, we're going to back it right back down into the comfy zone, and we'll see highs in the upper 80s. So in the shade, it's still going to feel okay. Now, Saturday and Sunday, our highs will be in the 80s, but we'll have rain in the forecast Saturday and Sunday. We're going to talk about how much of the day may be wet coming up in a little while, but it's definitely going to feel more muggy with the rain uh, in the area. Our normal high is 77, so we continue to see temperatures um, well above normal on Thursday and Friday. We do knock it back down to 81 on Sunday with that better chance for rain. We do have that boundary sitting over us right now. Uh, nothing yet popping up, uh, but we do have this boundary that you can pick out. I showed you uh, just a few minutes ago from around Greenville uh, through uh, Johnson County. County, back through Harnett County toward Hope County, just north of Fayetteville. And we're starting to see the clouds build there. So it may be just a, a few hours or so before we start to see some showers and thunderstorms developing right along that line. Again, the coverage should be minimal and we're not looking at anything severe. Check in those temperatures again. It really heats up. We have not yet hit 90 degrees officially at RDU this year, so we could hit it on Friday. And then our pattern completely changes. We get to a chance of showers and thunderstorms Saturday, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday as well, but it's more likely that we'll have uh, more rain Saturday and Sunday because of the proximity of a front. Uh, we are proud sponsors of the Cohen Race for the Cure, which is Saturday morning. We're going to take a closer look at the specific forecast for the race Saturday morning, as well as the Ham and Yam Festival, which we're also proud partners of, coming up in just a few minutes. Elizabeth, thanks. Several organizations are holding a day of mobilization in the face of the threat of anti-immigration legislation. What they're asking of lawmakers this short session at 4. Then at 5.30, the military says it is struggling to meet its recruiting goals. Hear from the former commander of Army Recruiting about the challenges they face getting young people to join. And still ahead this noon, some customers will soon be able to place bets at Dave & Buster's. Coming up, the games that are eligible for gambling and what you need to do to qualify.
And coming up in our next half hour, the big honor for these local high school musicians, why they are among the best of the best in the country, as we get a brief listen of what is in store in just 25 minutes. The FTC is putting pharmaceutical companies on notice. The agency is disputing more than 300 so-called junk patents. The FTC calls some of the patents filed by these companies bogus because they aren't related to the drug they sell. The agency also claims the patents could make the drug cost higher or prevent generic drug alternatives. Novo Nordisk, the company behind the diabetes drug Ozempic, is among the companies that has 30 days to remove or amend their patent listings. Pfizer is developing an online platform for patients to order medicine, including the COVID treatment, Paxlovid, and a migraine nasal spray. It's the latest push by drug makers to cut out the middleman and sell directly to people. Eli Lilly launched a similar website earlier this year. Pfizer's site is expected to launch in the coming months. It will connect customers with telehealth consultants to prescribe medications, while a drug dispensing partner will fill and ship prescriptions. Buckle up, commercial supersonic travel might be here sooner than you think. This is a one-third scale prototype of the Overture. It'll eventually become a boom supersonic passenger plane carrying about eight people. The plane is expected to fly about twice as fast as commercial planes do today. Boom already has more than 130 orders and pre-orders from United, American, and Japan Airlines. Compared to Concorde with half a century old technology, today we've got lighter materials, better aerodynamics, more efficient engines, and we put all that together. Our first airplane will be able to make supersonic flight available at business class kinds of fares. And then we'll be able to do premium economy, and then I think there's a future not too far away where supersonic can actually compete with economy class fares. Well, Boom is about to open a new factory in Greensboro. It's expecting to bring more than 1,700 jobs to North Carolina by the year 2030. And they hope to have passengers flying on these planes commercially by 2029. Walmart is looking to take on Trader Joe's and Whole Foods with a new line of premium food. It's called Better Goods and features 300 items ranging in price from under $2 to under $15. Most cost less than 5 bucks. The line includes oat milk ice cream, gluten-free muffin mix, and plenty of plant-based options. Better Goods is the first private brand line of food Walmart has launched in 20 years. The retailer is hoping it attracts new shoppers while encouraging current shoppers to spend more. Dave & Buster's will soon allow adult customers to bet on arcade games. The chain is partnering with a gamification software company to allow customers to place wagers on its games through an app. They will be able to compete with each other, earn rewards that lead to exclusive perks. The new feature will be available at all Dave & Buster's locations across the U.S. All right, if you're betting on your lottery odds, maybe you (laughs) bought a lottery ticket last night. Who knows? Here's a look at your winning lottery numbers. On your screen right now, NC Education Lottery. Back out to the WREL weather patio. How about a little smooth jazz on your lunch break? Let's listen in. We begin this half hour with breaking news. Thieves used a forklift to break into the Youngsville Gun Club. This happened just after 1 o'clock this morning near Franklin Park Avenue, and that is right where we find WRL's Julian Grace picking up the story from here. Julian. Well, Jeff, this is very shocking moments. We're just outside the Youngsville Gun Club, and in the video that we saw just moments ago that we will share with you later, you see a forklift in the middle of this parking lot, and the suspects, they back it up, 
and then they ram right into this gun range here, bust through the gate, and then you can see about three suspects run into this gun range. Now, according to the police department, the Youngsville Police Department, the suspects took several guns and possibly a long gun as well. Now, detectives have a very vague description of the suspects, but the surveillance video that you will see later today, it tells the story on what happened here. And then once again, you're looking at the aftermath. This gate is totally smashed in. The door is busted. Another gate cracked over there. We're going to have uh, more information for you later tonight at 4, 5, and 6 on this whole situation and a couple of leads the police could possibly have. All right, Julian Grace, thanks for that uh, bold use of that yeah. forklift there. What a method to break in. Right. Families impacted by the fentanyl epidemic are gathering outside of the state legislative building. Yeah, they're hoping to send a message to the state's lawmakers that more needs to be done to stop this issue. WRL Sean Gallagher is there, and Sean, these folks are coming from all across the state. <laughs> Yeah, Jeff, there are people that drove from two or more hours away just to be here to have their stories heard about how this drug has devastated their lives. One woman actually gave me this penny, but take a closer look. There's a small hole punched out in the center of that penny. That hole right there is 50 times greater than the amount of fentanyl that can kill someone. Now, families of about two dozen fentanyl victims from every corner of North Carolina gathered outside the state legislative building here this morning, sharing their stories of grief, holding pictures of their loved ones lost to this drug. Their goal to stop another family from feeling the devastating impacts fentanyl can cause. And despite more than 4,000 people dying from fentanyl poisoning or overdoses in 2022, they feel people are not taking this problem seriously enough. We don't want any other parent to feel what we feel. I have to know my son didn't die for nothing, you know, and if he doesn't save a life, then he died for nothing, and that can't happen. It can happen to anybody. Nobody is safe from this. As sad as it is, that's the most important thing for people to acknowledge. Now, after the rally today, the folks went inside the legislative building to speak to lawmakers about trying to put some $350,000 aside from uh, the state's opioid fund to try to put naloxone in every school in the state. Boxes just like this. This drug can reverse the, uh, the reactions from opioid use, guys. And we're seeing that more and more. Sean Gallagher, live from the legislative building. Thank you. The opioid crisis, is specifically fentanyl overdoses, was the focus of a recent WRL documentary, Crisis Next. Next door. The fentanyl epidemic is available right now on WRL.com. You can look for it in the documentary section. A new study shows that in the years leading up to menopause, women are more likely to experience depression. The study calculated the risk of depression during a woman's transition into menopause, known as paramenopause. It shows that women in this stage are about 40 percent more likely to be depressed. Researchers say there needs to be more awareness about this mental health shift so women can get the help they need. A ban on most abortions after six weeks of pregnancy is now in effect in Florida. That new law went into effect just after midnight. The ban makes it a felony to perform an abortion after six weeks of pregnancy. That gives a woman about two weeks after a missed period to realize she's pregnant if she wants to get an abortion. The new law has sparked protests across the state. An amendment to protect the right to an abortion is on the state's November ballot. Not all teachers knew from a young age that's what they wanted to be. How our Teacher of the Week ended up finding her calling. And today we have some musical entertainment in the WRL Azalea Gardens. We'll introduce you to these high school musicians who will be headed to New York City for an elite jazz festival. As we go to break, let's hear a little bit of their performance. Teacher of the Week didn't initially think about a career in education. Ken Smith introduces us to a teacher who found her calling after a stint in the classroom as a substitute teacher. 
Remember, we've also been practicing annotating. Helen Batch is a special education teacher at Riverbend Middle School. Okay, look at Skylar. After spending time as a longtime sub in a special ed class more than 20 years ago, her career path changed. And I very quickly learned that that was my passion. That was where I belonged. And from there, I've been in special education ever since. From the nomination letter we received, Mrs. Batts is known for dedicating herself wholeheartedly to her students. My main goal is for a child to never remain the same from when I first meet them. That's why she keeps a butterfly on her classroom door. When they first come to me, they might be like a little caterpillar. And my goal is when they leave me, they are butterflies that they can fly and go on their own. That is my mission. Mrs. Batts plans to retire at the end of this school year, but her life dedicated to serving others is far from over. My desire is for one day for somebody to give me a key to a home so that I can open and run a transitional home while I'm still serving people because my passion is serving. Mrs. Batts, you are WRL's Teacher of the Week. Congratulations. Ken Smith, WRL News. She said, me? Yes, Mrs. Batts. If you'd like to nominate a teacher like her, you can go to WRL.com and enter Teacher of the Week in the search box. Coming up, we are hearing more from the Triangle Youth Jazz, Jazz Ensemble. One of the members shares what it's like to be part of this group. That's next. Give this live look right now, just out back, the Azalea Gardens at WRAL. Beautiful gardens in bloom right now as you watch WRL News, available on Spectrum and the WRL app on your TV or streaming device. It's not always that we, we get this type of soundtrack that goes along with the Azalea Gardens here, at Renee, but that we have it today. Now tell you what, Jeff, today's garden visitors and our viewers right now are in for a treat because joining me here on the WRL Weather Patio, we have a group of talented high school musicians. You're looking at a subset of the Triangle Youth Jazz Ensemble, and they are one of 15 youth jazz ensembles in the country selected to go and perform in New York City for a prestigious competition. It's called the Essentially Ellington Jazz Festival, and they were the only band in the Carolinas to go and compete for this. And we have seven of them here. There are 23 of them in the group, but only seven of them here on the patio. And I know you want to hear them play because we've heard them a little bit. But before they do, we want to hear from Luke Ramey. He's a senior at Enlow High School. And Luke, talk about what it means for you to be able to take part in this national competition in New York City. I mean, it's always just such a great honor. Um, like you said, we're the only band in the Carolinas to have been selected, but we're also the only band ever in North Carolina to have been selected. And I believe this is our eighth time going as a band. It'll be my third time going. And I mean, it's just amazing to take part on a national stage and play the music of Duke Ellington. Um, at just such a high level and it's amazing. So Luke, you're a veteran at this. Um, how has competing and performing at this festival helped you in your musical journey? I mean, it definitely helped with nerves. Uh, the first time we went, I felt very nervous. I had a big solo and it was very scary, but I think the more times we go, if we start to feel more comfortable on the stage and more comfortable playing with each other. Um, and as we've you know, had more of those experiences together, I think we felt more of a togetherness as a group, which has definitely helped us play better. By the way, Luke is going to Juilliard after graduation, so a lot of talent here in this group. Yes, uh, they'll be headed to New York City in a week, but let's hear them play right now. Ladies and gentlemen, the Triangle Youth Jazz Ensemble. Thank you. 
the sounds of the Triangle Youth Jazz Ensemble. If you want to hear more of them, they have a concert coming up, a spring jazz concert at Meredith College at 115 this Sunday. You can get tickets there on their website. Best of luck to you, gentlemen, as you head to New York City. Can't wait to hear how it goes and have fun. And thank you for sharing your talents with us. Jeff, I could listen to them all day. How about you? I tell you, I could hear them. They could play weddings. They could play on, on I don't know, late night talk shows. I could hear them. They could take over the band, the Tonight Show band, right? They are awesome. Renee, nice job out there. They sound so good. Good luck to them in New York as well. Now, Elizabeth Gardner in the WRS Severe Weather Center. You've seen a couple of those uh, band members playing before. Four of them go to <laughs> Inlo, and my son plays in the jazz band with them at Inlo, and he's not going. He's he's not in the Triangle Jazz uh, Youth Band, but um, I feel sort of like a little bit of a proud mom because I've just watched them, you know, for the last several years, and just so proud of that group. It's amazing. All right, we have a couple of showers that are trying to pop up here. A little while ago, I showed you the satellite view, and you can see that band of cloud cover, and that's exactly where these showers are popping up uh, right here uh, to the south and east of Southern Pines to the west of Fayetteville and uh, really all up sort of uh, to the northern part of Cumberland County there. We'll take a look at Futurecast and that's exactly where we start to see that popping up here by uh, one or two o'clock. But notice that's really about it. I do feel like maybe that's a little bit underdone. We do have these showers starting to pop up down uh, around Cumberland County and the Sandhills. Certainly I, th I think we could see that stretching over toward Clinton and Goldsboro at the minimum. So it may not just be Cumberland County and then we'll see uh, all that tapering off once we get to sunset. A lot of this is going to be fueled just by our afternoon heating. Thursday and Friday for the most part look dry. We're looking at Saturday though and Sunday with a much better chance for rain. We have a cold front that will come through. It's going to feel like a summer pattern. Really we're going to have warm temperatures, afternoon and evening thunderstorms. But the big question is, is it going to rain on Saturday morning? Of course, uh, we're all interested because we know there's so many people who are going to be headed out to the race for the cure on Saturday morning. And for the last several days, Futurecast has showed a little bit of rain in the morning. Now there's lunchtime and you can see how the colors start to turn darker green and then uh, yellow. So that's the indication of more showers and storms. Definitely things pick up in intensity starting around lunch, uh, around lunchtime or so. And then on Sunday, same story. We start off with a little bit of rain and then turning into thunderstorms during the afternoon. And we get the uh, first look at our high resolution models tomorrow. We'll have a look at Saturday, so we'll be able to time that better. It's looking like we could easily see a half an inch to an inch of rain or more in some places over both days, Saturday and Sunday. And we keep talking about how, what a rain deficit we're seeing. We could definitely use this rain. Come and race for the cure. Uh, people start uh, checking in at seven o'clock. Temperatures will be in the 60s. We do have a 20% chance of rain in the forecast up until around lunchtime. Then we're going to start bumping it up. And so if you're headed to the Ham and Yam Festival Saturday from 10 to 7, certainly the first half of the day will be drier with a 20% chance, but we get up to around 60% chance around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon as those thunderstorms really get cranked up. And Sunday, again, looks almost like a carbon copy of Saturday. Temperatures will be in the low 80s for Saturday and Sunday. And then even Monday and Tuesday, we continue with that chance of a few afternoon and evening thunderstorms. So truly moving into a bit of a wetter pattern over the weekend, and it looks like that may continue. As a matter of fact, looking at the month of May as a whole from the Climate Prediction Center, we do have a good chance of above normal precipitation. Hopefully that'll allow us to catch up from this dry April, Jeff. We do need it. All right, Elizabeth, thank you. They are our national emblem of freedom, but life got off to a pretty rocky start for this pair of eaglets. And the winning Mega Millions numbers, 10, 18, 27, 37, 61. The Mega Ball is five, and the Mega Plier is three. Wrap things up this noon with a look at a few of the headlines we're following for you today. 
The UNC Chapel Hill Faculty Committee is holding an emergency meeting this afternoon. They're discussing events related to the protests on campus. A group started gathering on UNC's campus on Friday, forming what they call a Gaza Solidarity Encampment. The situation escalated several times yesterday with clashes between protesters and police. The protesters have since dispersed. The emergency meeting starts at four this afternoon. A procession for one of the four law enforcement officers killed in Charlotte on Monday is happening right now.